So good evening, everybody in Brazil, our friends of the Brazilian Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery. Good evening, a very special good evening for our special guest, Professor Mark Proctor, who is someone who we admire for a long time. Uh, I thank you very much for the presence here with us tonight, and uh, sure we will have a very nice session. Thank you, especially to our scientific committee, to Professor Bizi, who is the head of the committee, and to Marcos Devani, who made the articulation so we could have Professor Proctor here with us tonight. And uh, I will, uh, Professor Proctor is the head of pediatric neurosurgery at Boston Children's Hospital and at the University of Harvard. And I will pass uh, the stage to our friend, Marcos Devani, to moderate the session. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Juca. Thank you, Dr. Proctor. Uh, as Dr. Juca said, Dr. Proctor is a neurosurgeon in chief from Boston Children's Hospital and professor at Harvard Medical School. He's going to talk about endoscopic treatment for cranosinostos. That is one of his main uh, themes about the, the themes, uh, e uh, subjects in the in the assistential field, in the uh, research field also. And it's a pleasure for us to have him here to talking about this uh, for us. Please uh, be welcome to, to start the presentation, Dr. Proctor. Great, thanks. Thanks so much to the uh, Society for the invitation. Thank you, thank you, Marcos. Uh, personally, Marcos spent some time with me here, so we've become uh, good friends over, over time. And I just had the opportunity to be in Brazil just uh, two weeks ago and got to meet uh, Eduardo in, in, in person. So really uh, a pleasure to be able to follow up. I'm, I'm gonna share my screen now to uh to uh show the talk or are you able to see the talk there yes okay great so uh, marcos asked if i would talk about the endoscopic management of cranial synostosis and I'll, I'll sort of do a broad overview of of the field and please uh feel free to questions come up to to, to just uh, interrupt so um there we go. I, this is a sophisticated audience, so I'm not going to go too much into the background of synostosis. But as you know, it's about one in every 2,000, 2,200 live births. Uh, most of what I'll talk about today is single sutures synostosis, but we'll, there'll be some, some more complicated forms as well. And you, usually it results in a stereotypic shape. And as you know, most cases are sporadic. In other words, not running in the families, but we all treat lots of syndromic children as well. And in the conference that I recently did in uh, Brazil and Baru was on uh, Apert syndrome. So just to go over a little bit about the basic and you know anatomy of a of a human skull. So as, as we can see here on the the left, unlike unlike long bones that just basically grow at their at their ends, at the endochondrial bone, the skull is membranous bone formation. So you could think of it as these little islands of bone, and they grow it's essentially in 360 degrees all around that bone plate, and eventually come together at what we call the cranial sutures. And uh, the view on the left is a is a fetus at about 12 weeks, and on the right would be the normal newborn. Uh, this next one is just an interesting case I had recently, which was not not a fetal case. This was a full full term child that was born really for the first time in my career, showing what just appears to be the the membranous bone formation. You can really see. All the bones as their separate entities, uh, you know, with these growth plates. And this was a study being done early in life, and the child didn't have any hydrocephalus. I show the axial studies just to show there's no hydrocephalus. And then the child presented with with progressive microcephaly. They just um, fell fell off their growth curves, and all of the sutures fused together. Really, a very un unique case. But I thought it was just nice to show that how those membranous bones all come together, and if if the growth plates don't stop growing, you develop this synostosis. So why do we have, why, you know, if we look in the animal world, there's very few models similar to, to human cranial synostosis. 
And why is that? It's, it's because much more growth of the brain happens postnatally in humans than it does in animals. Because we walk on two legs, you know, we really can't hold the the pregnancy till till the point where the brain is fully grown, and that's why human babies come out so much more helpless than, say, a, a cow or other animals that basically can be independent of the mother almost almost immediately. So, if we think of cranial sutures, really, what what are they? What are what are the sutures? So they're they're very um, cellular and they're what we call osteoblastic. In other words, they're making new bone. So circumferentially around that growth plate, we're just making new, blown, new bone. And there comes a point where that growth is supposed to stop. You know, you're supposed to have the sort of apoptosis, programmed cell death. And that's under the direction of the FGFR receptors. But sometimes it doesn't happen. We have too much bone going on. There's excess of activity, and this res this is what results in synostosis. So the FGFR tends to be, you know, if you look at the at the the sutures themselves, and we do this on almost every case. We take the specimen of the suture. It's almost always an FGFR uh, abnormality that leads to synostosis as as a final pathway. So as we know, if you have synostosis, it leads to these stereotypic changes with the normal skull there on the left and various forms of synostosis shown on the right. I don't really need to go over that with this audience. Um, but if we move into treatment, you know, it's where have we been o over time? And, you know, for those who are a little bit older, you know, back Several decades ago, we would do big incisions. They could be ear to ear or front to back, and then just remove the, the suture. So is it what we'll call an open strip craniectomy. Why did we ever move away from that? Well, it's because the results weren't so good. About a third of the children would fuse back the bones too early. They wouldn't get the shape that you that you really wanted. Uh, and ultimately the the outcome was was suboptimal. So then came Dr. Tessier from France and, and others who decided, well, if only opening the bones not going to work, let's really move the bones into new positions. And that's that's what we really saw from about the 1970s to the 2000s. That's a preferred way of treating this was making a big incision, ear to ear incision, taking off the bones and moving them in you know, whichever way you needed to to correct that particular deformity. As, as any of us that have done a lot of synostosis know, that's not perfect either. Number one, it's a big operation. But number two, there's a lot of regression, right? If you treat unilateral coronal synostosis or metopic synostosis, it tends to it tends to go back the way it was slowly over time, generally not as bad as it originally was. But it would be, you know, it, it wouldn't be intellectually honest of us to suggest that the results are perfect with these big open operations. So back in the 1990s, David Jimenez and Constance Peroni, they, they thought, hey, technology has changed. We now have the opportunity to do these smaller operations with an endoscope. We're not disturbing the surrounding tissues as much. And we have experience because a lot of kids have been sleeping on their backs and getting flat spots. We now have experience with helmets and maybe that would make a change. And that's really where the the new era of this minimally invasive surgery started. And the question is, is you know, are we doing better than we did in the past? And I would argue that that we are, that we're has previously strip craniectomy having a one-third failure rate. Now really less than five percent of kids should should be requiring an additional operation. And for single suture synostosis, even lower. So why have we been slow to adopt endoscopy for synostosis? And I'd, I'd like to just sort of look back on the literature of um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which was one of the first common operations done using an endoscope. And when it first came out, it was in 1987, it was reported by a team in France, and it actually met a lot of early skepticism, similar to what we've seen in the neurosurgery and plastic surgery community with endoscopic synostosis surgery. Uh, a lot of people thought this was not this was not safe, this was not the correct way to do it. 
although within just a few years, it became the treatment of choice. But if you look at some of the early literature on laparoscopic cholecystectomy, I think the titles are actually fairly funny, like let us control the virus as if it was, you know, we were creating a, a, a new problem with this type of operation. Then this one here, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, passing fancy or le legitimate treatment options. So, you know, sort of e really within a year, people started thinking, okay, maybe there's a little bit of benefit to this. Then just a year later, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, threat or opportunity, and you can see the, the, uh, the introduction there, laparoscopic cholecystectomy is here to stay. And some of the lessons that were learned there were that if you want to do laparoscopic cholecystectomy, you sort of have to know how to do an open cholecystectomy, right? You have to be able to get yourself out of troubles and you have to really understand the operation, the, the pathology, and, and really how to do it in all different ways. And I think this is no different from what we see in, in um, the cranial synostosis world. And, you know, as Marco can say, yes, we I treat a lot of kids endoscopically, but I treat almost as many with open surgery. So we, you know, I'm doing about a hundred operations a year, and it's a sort of 50 or 55 endoscopically and 45 to 50 uh open operations. And I think, you know, this day and age you need to be able to do both. And when we looked at sort of this was a work group, an international work group back about uh, a little over 10 years ago, and really the the big finding was that you need a team. Like if you really want to take care of synostosis in a comprehensive way, you need a team to do so. And I would argue that that's, that's true today, that, you know, as, as Marcos would have seen while he was here, in a modern craniofacial center, if you have a newborn with synostosis, that patient really should be referred to a team, and then that team could decide okay, is this appropriate for a minimally invasive procedure or should it be an open procedure? Now, you can make that into an algorithm. It's not like every patient now needs to come and see the entire team. You, you could know as a team that if it's an uncomplicated patient with sagittal synostosis, less than three or four months, you're going to treat it endoscopically. But I, I would argue that this team approach is really important and leads to better outcomes. Um, for those that are interested, this is an article that... Uh, I published this year with Federico de Rocco from France. It was part of the 50th anniversary uh, edition of Child's Nervous System. And it just looks at sort of the evolution of synostosis surgery for the past for the past five decades. So I would say that the, you know, the current trend towards this minimally invasive surgery, it's really different from what we were doing before. So previously. It was an open operation, which is really a mechanical operation where you're moving the bones into the right place. And with the endoscopic operation, it's a release procedure. I think of it conceptually, conceptually like you're turning synostosis into a deformational problem. Now you've opened the bone, so now you just have a skull shape that's abnormal that you have to renormalize with growth. And that it, in in my view, and I know others have actually tried this without helmets, but I think you do better with something like a helmet or if you want to use springs, distractors, all that's fine. But essentially, you're, you're intervening early enough that brain growth is going to have a big impact on the ultimate outcome. So now I'll go through you know, some of the various uh, conditions one by one. So sagittal synostosis long, narrow head, nothing surprising there. This is a patient, you know, that we're preparing for surgery, uh, looking looking down, breathing tube coming out here. Uh, this outlines one incision, this is the other, and everything else is just markings that help us during the operation. And I would suggest that if you're treating sagittal synostosis, basically you want to get from, from this shape here in, in F to this shape here in F. And it, in many ways, it doesn't matter how you get there. So you could do it as in the panel here, A, with two small incisions and just removing the, the suture and using a helmet. You could do it the same thing, putting in springs, just keeping in mind you didn't have to remove the springs. You could do various open operations. You could do a extended strip craniectomy with barrel staves, you could put in distractors. And then there's, as, as you all know, there's just 
almost an infinite number of ways you could do a cranial vault reconstruction. But again, you ultimately you want to get from that scaphalocephalic head shape to a normal to a normal head shape. So here I'll just take you through a, an operation just for those who haven't seen it, so you can see it. You can see it. This is what we call the Doro head holder. Just a nice way of holding the baby in a in a modified uh, position there. I'm oh, sorry. I'll go back to that here just to to show you the uh, position. So this is sort of a nice what we call sphinx position. Head's a little extended. You don't overly extend it, but the babies tolerate that well. Keeps the head elevated up above the rest of the body. And uh, it's just a sort of an, I used to use a bean bag, but this is a more elegant way of doing it. Uh, here you can see the incisions, just giving a little epinephrine here to reduce any bleeding. You make the incisions with a, a, a needle point coag just to reduce bleeding. And here you can see opening the two incisions, scoring the periosteum, and then creating a burr hole at each site. So this is the back incision, creating that burr hole and expanding it. And here you can see using a kerosene to enlarge it, and then doing the same thing at the front. So once we've made those uh, openings, we'll take it in the front, we'll go all the way up to the fontanelle. And usually you could do that just with kerosene because we're already there. And in the back, we'll go back to the lambdoid suture and now we'll switch to this, the view of the scope here. So you can see as we bring in the, uh, the scope, there's the, there's the ridge. Um, you can see where the sagittal sinus sort of pokes up you know, the, the um, sagittal suture pokes down and the Sinus is sort of compressed, compressed by it. So there's the internal ridge, and you just use the scope. And you know one of the advantages of a few suture is that the dura is not stuck. So we just use the scope to help depress the dura. If there is an emissary vessel, we coagulate it. Um, and then when you you go under the bone, you can really get all the way to your other burr hole in the front. And there you can see that right there. And then we just use these bone cutting scissors to, to remove the bone. In this case, I think the bone came out in two, two halves, one from the front, one from the back. Uh, and sometimes it comes out in one piece, but that it's irrelevant as long as the bone is disconnected at the end. So here you can see we're making those cuts. And I only take about two centimeters in these operations. I don't go for a wide, wide opening. Then I coat it with gel foam. And then the most important thing at the end is just to be sure the bones are moving. You know, so we physically move them at the end to be sure that's all that's all worked. And that operation, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes. It's a really a very quick, quick procedure. So obviously that video is sped up, but it's it's a very quick procedure. Here's just another another view. This is a different case where the bone came out in one piece. You can see how we bandage it at the end. And then we use a helmet. And these, these, these helmets here are for different indications, like the bottom left here is for metopic synostosis. The top one was by, by coronal synostosis. And this is uh, sagittal synostosis. So you can see where we have contact front, front to back and over the top and we leave the sides open. And here's a view. So these, these are views that are made by the helmet folks, the orthotists, right? So they, they used to have to make a cast to, uh, to look at the, um, to make the helmet, but now they do it all with 3D imaging and you can get a sense over time. It's a really nice way to follow the patient and see how the head shape has changed over time. For unilateral coronal synostosis, the operations all share a basic a basic flow. For this, you could see a pretty classic case here. Um, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit more detail. So here's a classic right unilateral coronal synostosis. This on the plain X-ray, you can see this little peak here that we call the Harlequin eye. And on the 3D CTs, you could see how the eye is much higher on the affected side. The nose always tilts towards that side and you get significant frontal flattening. 
right? So how are we gonna do the operation? Well, very similar, except we only use one incision for this. We make an incision sort of at the midpoint of the suture and we just remove it all the way to the fontanelle and all the way down till we get to essentially the, the temporal fossa. So again, you have this condition, you could treat it either endoscopically like you see here on the left, or you could do a frontal orbital advancement. And they're both gonna get you a good, a good result. I just say, if you have two operations that are gonna get a pretty good result, the one that's sort of physiologically easiest on the child is probably the best, best way to go. Here you can see one of the articles uh, we published on, uh, on UCS, and you can see it has a very nice correction over time of, of the, the forehead of, yeah, the, the re, it's not immediate. You're not, you're not gonna wake up from the operation with this shape, but this on average at about six to seven months, you're gonna see a, a shape like this. Um, here's a case of unilateral coronal synostosis, right? Classic left-sided unilateral coronal, Here's the closed suture. You can see that massive, what we'll call facial torticollis or just massive uh, slanting of the whole face. It start, starts right here at the uh, nasofrontal junction and goes down to the chin point. And now look at this child here, post-op. Like, honestly, you wouldn't even know it was post-op, right? You just say that's a normal child. The face is straight, the eyes are level, and they even have a, a normal suture on that on that left side. Uh, sorry, it's not advancing. There we go. So here you can see, and this is this is one of the interesting components of endoscopic surgery is a lot of kids just form a normal suture. And as a result, they have normal growth over time. And I think, you know, as, as many of you know, if you do a front orbital advancement, you get a post-op scan. You never develop normal sutures. You never really see normal growth over time. But I think because we disturb so little of the surrounding tissues, they form this neo suture. We'll go over that a little bit more later. With regard to the facial symmetry for unilateral coronal synostosis, it's actually much better after the small operation. So we study all the kids. We have 3D photography setups. So we've been doing this 3D photography on all the kids and analyzing the results. And we published this a long time ago that if you look here on the left, the child who had um, a frontal orbital advancement they continue to have that facial deviation. I think most of you would know when you correct unilateral coronal synostosis, you don't really correct the tilt of the nose or the face, but when you do it endoscopically, probably just because we're intervening so early, the face really corrects. And it's, uh, it's, it's very gratifying to see. Uh, and the forehead symmetry is really the same with the two operations. So I'd say with the smaller operation, you're actually getting better facial correction similar forehead symmetry. And the one other issue that I don't have in this talk is that the rate of needing subsequent eye muscle surgery is much less than the kids that were treated endoscopic surgery. I think as the, as the orbit moves out, it actually stretches the muscle. Whereas if you think, what do we do in a frontal orbital advancement? The first thing we do before we remove the bone is we, we detach the periorbiter, right? So it, even though you may move out the the bone, you're not actually stretching the muscle because you've, you've detached it. Bilateral coronal synostosis, um, I'll tell you in the interest of time, this is actually a video, uh, but in the interest of time, I won't go through it. It's just another video showing the, the technique, but this is published. So if you go to the JNS uh, Journal of Neurosurgery Focus, um, there's a whole video, um, addition on cranial synostosis and you can you can you can watch this it takes you through a bilateral coronal synostosis operation start to finish I, and it should but this is about six or seven minutes and probably not worth uh, going through separately but here's uh this is just a, i showed this slide in brazil a couple of weeks ago this is a child with apert syndrome you can see preoperatively they have that sort of classic early developing turicephaly from the bilateral coronal synostosis. Most of you know this, it, some sort of early operation seems to be indicated. A lot of centers are moving out the back. They're doing distraction at the back. 
But this is what happens if you if you just release the sutures, right? So you open up the sutures here, you use a helmet, and you can see that's a pretty normal shape and particularly good for someone with Apert syndrome. So by addressing the problem directly, by addressing the fused coronal sutures, you can really get a nice correction. Uh, and here's just similarly some of those laser scan assessments on a child with bilateral coronal synostosis, showing how it corrects over, over time with release of the sutures and the helmet. Metopic synostosis, uh, as you know, it's a very varied phenotype. Some kids have a closed suture and their forehead shape is totally normal, and we never operate on those cases. But once this inner frontal angle here gets gets below consistently about 118 degrees, that tends to be the, the trigger for surgery. Um, I will say that you may see this in Brazil. We certainly see it in the United States. Kids getting operated on just for a ridge, a uh, ridge with a normal head shape. And, and in my view, that's, that's really never indicated. These ridges, this is the same child at a few months of age and a year of age. And if you just follow it for a few years, that ridge always goes away. Essentially, it's an area of thickening of the bone. And as the surrounding bone thickens, that, that's going to disappear. But then there's cases of real trigonocephaly. And this is a real case. You know, In this case, the interfrontal angle is pretty, pretty extreme, probably in the 90, 95 degree range. And again, if you can achieve the same result with a small operation, as opposed to a big operation, it's probably it's probably a worth worthwhile way of proceeding. And here I could just this is will just be pictures, but taking you through that similar operation. So here's a child with trigonocephaly. This is just positioning, draping. Here here we are putting in the um, the uh, epinephrine, making the incision with that needle tip creating a burr hole here you can see just a you know just a very discreet burr hole and um, then using uh, using the endoscope to free everything up and remove the bone and here you can see the view from the endoscope as you're as you're removing it I tend to use something called the sonopet which is like it's an ultrasonic aspirator for bone which is really nice for the thick bone down down at the base but you can also use a drill and one thing I learned at the um, ISPN meeting in Vino del Mar, Chile, is um, there's a group did a very nice study from South America, finding that if you made the gap too wide, you actually got a, too much of a depression there. And they were getting better results with narrow gaps. So I've started to narrow up my gap even more so where it's only about five millimeters at the base. So I, you know, I did one of these cases today and it's about tapers from about a centimeter at the top to about five millimeters at the bottom. And here you can see at the end, we just irrigated out with some bass tracing. And uh, here's, here's the incision. It's only about two centimeters. And again, here's just, the, these are all very objective. These are just laser scans showing the, the results. So this is a six month laser scan on a follow-up for one of these cases. Lambdoid synostosis, as you guys all know, it's very rare to have true lambdoid synostosis, but we do see it, you know, probably twice a year we'll have a case. So we, it took us many, many years to get to it, but we published that data a few years ago and we had about 20 patients and found that when we compared our open results at endoscopic release at three to four months compared to um, our open results, it was very equivalent. In fact, the endoscopic kids really were doing better because as most of you know, if you have, um, if you have lambdoid synostosis, you tend to get, I'm just gonna pull a skull off my, my shelf here, you tend to get that sort of windswept appearance where it all sort of tilts over to the other side. And in my view, there's something about releasing that bone early and using the helmet, it sort of pushes it back. So I, I, the windswept appearance is something I've had a lot of trouble correcting in the big open operations, but it does pretty well with the endoscopic operations. So what are the advantage of using the endoscope? It's physiologically far easier on the baby as you know, you, many of you now have experience doing these as Marcos saw in, in my center. It, the operations are, the total time from when the baby enters the operating room to leaves is about two hours. 
the surgery itself tends to be about 30 minutes. So it's, it's really easy on the child. And I do think that the formation of an, a normal suture afterwards has a big benefit over time. So this, this is a study done by a group from St. Louis, not by my group. But they, they looked at this condition in sagittal synostosis. So here you could see after endoscopic surgery, just the formation of a normal suture. They saw it with lambdoid synostosis. Uh, and here you could see that nice result of that of that windswept appearance in their in their study. Um, we published it as well for unilateral coronal. You could see that this formation of this normal suture just seems to lead to very normal growth over time. So I've I've now been doing this technique for 20 years since um, 2004, and I can tell you that when you follow these kids for five to 10 years, each year they're getting a little better. So it's a little better, a little better, which is different from what we tend to see with a front orbital advancement, where if you if 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 you follow your unilateral coronal synostosis kids for 10 years or your metopic kids for 10 years, each year they're getting a little worse and a little worse and a little worse. So the the normal suture that redevelops seems to sort of reset the biologic clock and lead to normal growth over time. Um, here's a neosuture in an apert patient, right? So even the syndromic patients can really have this have this response. So you'd see not just a really nice shape correction, but they form normal sutures and never needed another operation. So I think the there's something where we're still learning about synostosis, but it seems that the the problem sets up at some point in gestation. It's probably a little bit of a of a double phenomena. You have to have a, a genetic predisposition and maybe a little pressure on the suture. Or some, something else is happening. But when you open the suture postnatally, it's it's like you're resetting the clock. They're forming just normal sutures over time. So how do, how does the technique work? I mean, we've done lots of articles looking at it suture by suture, but this was uh, something we published uh, a few years back, looking at the first 500 patients. I've now done uh, about 825 patients, but this was 500 patients that all had at least one year follow up. You can see it's sort of the typical distribution, about two thirds male. It's because 80% of sagittal synostosis is in, in boys. Our average age of surgery was three months. Average weight, you'll see almost six kilos. So we always wait to five kilos. I don't like to operate before five kilos. Just more likely they're going to need blood transfusions. Um, the average average operative length is 47 minutes. That that's not skin to skin. That's that's from like when anesthesia says, okay, you can you can start to do your thing. So it includes all the prep and drape and everything. Average time under anesthesia, just over two hours. See the uh, estimated blood loss about 13 mLs per, per kilo. One day in the hospital, very few patients go to the ICU. And the helmet compliance was quite high in my group, about 92%. And in, in this article, we had nearly six years of follow-up. And here you can see the distribution, nothing surprising. Half the kids were sagittal synostosis because half of all synostosis is sagittal. 93% were non-syndromic, but we still had about 7% of this series were syndromic. And you can see most of them were APERT. At that time, we had 17 APERT patients. Now we have 27. 27 APER patients. So what were some of the cumulative data? Well, 6% needed blood transfusions, which included the syndromic patients, which were much higher. Um, and how do, how do we follow the kids, right? Like, you know, you do the operation, how do you, how do you follow them? Well, I see all the kids back at four weeks after surgery, because I want to be sure that the helmet is fitting right and we're achieving the, the desired outcome. And then after that, I see them about every three months until their birthday. And then every year till at least five or six years for the non-syndroma kids. And for the syndroma kids, we follow them into, into their adult years. So uh, what do we do at each visit? We always check the head circumference and I'm, I'm very big on checking, you know, using calipers to check the measurements. 
We do eye exams on all the kids. For the syndroma kids, it's every year at least. And for the non-syndroma kids, it's at least one exam when they're in the four, four to five year range. We don't do routine imaging. Uh, we do it as needed. And at this point in time, we do we do, do formal neuropsych testing on, uh, it's just standard of care in our team. Um, just a you know, question you always get is how long do you need to follow these kids for? And I think it's the important thing to understand there is how long does the brain grow for, right? Well, you know, because you really need to follow it through, through the completion of growth. And so you don't wanna stop following synostosis babies at one year of age, the shape may be okay, but any child with it who had synostosis is at some risk for refusion of the sutures. So if you look at this, there's several studies now that show similar data in different ways. Uh, this one looked at brain weight. Um, this was an early study based you know, on the autopsy, but basically you could see brain weight essentially hit full adult size by five years of age. Here's the 60 month point. This was an MRI study looking at it and very similar, well over 95% completion of brain growth by six years of age. So the, the answer is you probably need to follow all the kids till about five or six, or you're gonna miss some kids who have problems over time. You can see here, this is a couple of patients in, in my population. This is a child you could see um, on the left here who, this was an APER child and you can see how the, they stayed on their growth curves. They did quite favorably. In fact, a 53% increase in where they were. And you, you saw that over time, whereas this is a child who needed a second operation. And why? Because their head growth went down, right? So that's why I'm, I'm, I feel following the head growth is so important. But you're almost always going to know by about one year to 18 months if a child's failed and needs an additional operation. That, that head growth pattern is going to be pretty clear, generally by 12 to 18 months. So based on this, I follow all the kids to six years at least. Um, and I know that most kids who are going to need an operation are going to need it by about two or three years of age. So if we look at the cost, the value of the operation, you know, what I commonly hear in, in, in countries where the helmets are not easily available is just that the cost of the helmet is so high. And, and I would just suggest that the overall cost of treatment is much, much lower. Now, it, it is true that your system may pay for all the injury the hospital care and they may not pay for the helmet care. So to the patient, it could feel more expensive to use a helmet. But we looked at this and now there's at least three really good studies that look at the cost, but this was our, our study. And what you could see is all costs, including helmets, gas mileage, you know, you name it, all costs, the treating a child endoscopically costs about 40% of the open operation. The, the operating room time, the hospital stay, everything else is so minimized that it's a much cheaper treatment option. So when you, you know, when your Department of Health tells you, gee, you know, we can't pay for the helmets, it's way too expensive, they have to take a step back and look at the overall cost of care for that, that patient. And one thing I will say is they're now starting to 3D print helmets, which is really going to bring the cost down, right? So you just do those those laser scans and you can you can have the helmet available to you within within hours with using 3D printing. And I think this is going to you know revolutionize this this method of treatment. So what's the value of the operation? I mean if the value is an outcome that's meaningful to the patient over the cost, it's you know because the cost is so much lower, the value is so much higher if you're getting getting a good outcome. And I would argue the outcomes are really excellent. You know, I, I would say they're equally on par and I feel like I, I, you know, there's no benefit to me to do the operation endoscopically if kids are doing better open. I do it because I think it's better for the child. So what's the verdict then? I, I'd say the outcomes are really comparable. In many ways, I'd say the outcomes are better in the endoscopic operations, but I'll, I'll concede comparable. It's definitely safer much lower rates of blood transfusion, 
the theoretical concerns people bring up about well, you don't have good access, this and that, it's, it's just not borne out over time. I mean, we just know now, like I said, I've done over 800 cases, but the experience around the world is, you know, probably a, about a third of synostosis cases that are thought to be now treated endoscopically. And there's just hundreds of articles showing showing the safety. So how do I make my decision? Basically, if the child's three to four months of age, I will consider endoscopic. The only type of case I won't treat endoscopically is clover leaf. I think it's just too the the uh, bone jutting into the brain is too difficult to to manage if if you have a clover leaf skull. You can't reoperate endoscopically. If you if you treated the child endoscopically and they fail, your next operation is going to be open. And obviously, family preference. If they don't want to treat it endoscopically, then for sure we'll treat it open. For open, basically, in my hands, if you're over six months, I'm probably not going to treat you endoscopically. Uh, open is good for any severity. And of course, if it's a reoperation, that's the way you're going to treat it. So just to, to close it up, I'd say, I mean, there's a, now extensive literature with over 20 years follow-up and David Jimenez was had his first publication come out in the mid, mid 1990s. So he, you know, that's almost 30 years now. I've, I've been doing it for 20 years and I'm absolutely convinced that it's sort of safe, effective and reliable. I, I truly do feel the outcomes are on par with open surgery. The value is much greater. And I, I think if you're gonna be a modern craniofacial center, you really wanna know how to do both. You know, It's not that you have to do them all one way or all the other way, but you wanna know how to do both and offer this as a standard to your, to your kids. So uh, happy to take any questions. I, you know, I know we wanted to leave at least a good 15 minutes for that. So if questions come up, happy to, happy to take them on. Very nice, Dr. Proctor. Thank you very much. Uh, the lecture was fantastic. Uh, I would like to say that we have uh, today a record of audience from the pediatric neurosurgeons. It was uh, really nice. Uh, I, I would like to say that uh, since uh, <laughs> I started to do some cases too, I was invited to give some lectures and and every time I, I have the opportunity, I used to say, uh, uh, when I went in Boston, I, I, I would like to see beyond the tech, technique, but also the, from the, uh, the outpatient clinic, your cases. And, and you couldn't have chosen the patients to go to the outpatient when I was there. So I could, I could really see the good results that you show in the the slides because as you started in the beginning sometimes we saw the the lectures or the, the new trends in techniques as with skepticism no ah, no this is not work yeah it's a new trend it's it's not real but when you go and you see the patients coming and you see you know it's true i i, I like it very much the results and i was impressed actually we have some questions uh i i know you have a uh a busy schedule this night and uh I, I don't know we could start by some question from the audience is it possible sure sure okay so uh the first question is from uh, dr simone rogério she said during the follow-up how many months usually the child has to use the helmet how often we have to change it yeah, so I, I would say across the whole series of about, you know, the, when we published the 500 patients, the average length of time in the helmet was between six and seven months. So if they had the operation at three months, most kids were out of the helmet by uh, nine or 10 months. A couple of things to keep in mind, the kids with sagittal synostosis, they tend to regress a little bit. So... If you've, we always look at what's called the, you know, the cephalic index or cranial index. So let's say the average and the starting point is about 0.68 in the series. We want, we want them to end up about 0.1 better, about 0.78 or so. So if they're like 0.75, we'll keep them in the helmet till a year. 
But if they hit 0.8, we'll stop the helmet sooner, knowing that they'll regress back a little bit. So for sagittal, they do regress a little bit. But for the other forms like metopic, when you when you correct correct a child with metopic, once you get to the desired result, they don't regress. So we have some kids getting out of the helmet in about three months. Uh, and, and I don't mind taking them out because I know it's not going to go back the other way. For kids with um, unilateral coronal, most of them, those are the toughest ones to, or it takes the longest. So most of those kids are in the helmet closer to their birthday, but I never helmet past their birthday. There's, there's another question here. Lazaro Lima said, uh, if there is a, a, a limit to choose the endoscopic surgery regarding the deformity or the severity of the deformity, for example, for uh, scaphocephaly that has a very uh, narrow shape in the back, for example, is there any, any issues to, to choose endoscopic for these cases? No, I, I really don't pick or choose at all based on severity. So the, the only exception, when I say severity, I mean shape. So I, it could be quite severe, but we will still treat the child endoscopically. If it's a severe compression of the brain, and what I mean by that is the clover leaf, where you're really seeing bone jutting into the brain, that, that I don't try and treat endoscopically. But we will treat really any degree of severity endoscopically. And what I say to the family is, worst case, they need a second operation. It's very rare. But even if you treat a very severe case endoscopically, it gets much better. Like even if it's not perfect and you need a second operation, it gets a whole lot better um, because you, you've sort of taken the edge off with, um, with that operation. But, but the, the, the rates you saw there, you know, the total reoperation was about 6%. Most of those are syndromic kids. So for the non-syndromic, the reoperation rates really should be about one or 2%. Um, another question from Dr. Paulo Ronaldo is how low we have to cut at cases of plagiocephaly, the unicoronal suture? Yeah, so let me just pull another another model off the shelf here. So when I when I treat coronal synostosis, you know what they call that harlequin eye is where the coronal suture really wraps up around the top of the eye here. So normally the coronal suture sort of follows down to the to the terion to the uh, sphenoid wing, but when you have coronal synostosis, that this the sphenoid wing really rotates forward, and that's what your that's what the harlequin eye is on an X-ray. It's that anterior rotation. So I always want to get down to the squamosal bone here. So you do, that doesn't mean you follow the coronal because eventually that will take you here. Uh, so what I do is I keep going until I cross the sphenoid wing, and then I take it all the way down to the squamosal suture here. So essentially, I'm looking under the temporal lobe at the end of the operation. I think if you don't get that low, it's really hard to fully release the bone and have it move out on you. Good. So the, the failures I've seen, and it's usually, you know, someone's come to me from another center, is they stopped they stopped the release at the sphenoid wing, and that that's probably the tightest point of restriction. Uh... Dr. Flavio uh, Lima asked, eh, what is the width of strip bone removed in sagittal coronal? It, it changes between the, the types? Yeah, so for sagittal, I used to do a wide strip and even make barrel stave cuts. And what I found is that the results didn't seem to be better than when I did narrow strips. So at this point, I really do about, for a sagittal, about a two centimeter strip. And a, a couple of centers here in the US have studied that. They've studied the wide strip versus a narrow strip and actually found that there was no difference. So a wide strip, six, six centimeters with barrel staves had no outcome benefit to a narrow strip. So most centers here have gone to the narrow strip of about two centimeters. 
for coronal synostosis, I, for, for my topic I already mentioned, I, I really have even gone narrower. I'm just really unlocking the bone so they move independently. For coronal, I'm doing about a one centimeter strip. Um, I, I don't think, you know, as, as we know, even when we were doing these open strip craniectomies and lining the edges with silastic or, or some form of metal, et cetera, that's not what stops the sutures from fusing, right? Even with big strip craniectomies and lining the edges, kids were still fusing back. It's the direct, in my view, the directed growth of the brain. It's the brain pushing out in the right area. And that's where the, the helmet has been so important in preventing recent osteosis before things get to where they need to be. I think the other important thing is that we the, we leave the periosteum fully intact, right? We're not, it's not like you're doing a big operation and disturbing everything. The periosteum is normal, the dura is normal, and that's why I think they form these normal sutures back. Dr. Gap raised his hands. He would like to, to make a question. Thank you, Dr. Parker, for your wonderful lecture. Uh, here in Brazil, we have a problem with the helmet. It's so expensive for us here. So some groups in the world are publishing about the, the same surgery, the endoscopy surgery, without the helmet, and they are publishing good results. What do you think about the, the surgery without helmets? Yeah, I saw the recent publication on using on doing this operation, not using a helmet for sagittal synostosis. Um, I don't, I don't have any personal experience with it. I, you know, I, I, I do use the helmet. I will say that I've had a few patients who haven't been very compliant with the helmet. It, it's, it's anecdotal. I mean, no, no scientific analysis of it, but my sense is that the results haven't been quite as good. But it, it will be very interesting to see. You know, certainly 30, 40, 50 years ago, when you were just doing the strip craniectomy, a lot of kids fused the bones back together. But again, that was in the setting of removing all the scalp, interrupting a lot of the normal vasculature, et cetera. So it may well be that doing just the strip craniectomy when you're leaving all the periosteum and everything pretty intact is going to be enough, you know. It's it's interesting that Ricardo that that's not how it started right because when Jimenez started the operation he started it with the with the helmet so we don't really then we even had people who were treating with helmets and no surgery right but no one's really tried until now this modification of doing the endoscopic strip without the helmet so I. I think it would be hard for me at this point in my career to start doing that because if I had any kids fused back together, I, I feel really, I feel really bad. But I think, especially in places that maybe it's a little harder to get the helmet, that would be, I think, a really interesting study. I do think the helmets are going to get easier and cheaper with three D printing, though. Good, Doctor Juca. I think you would like to make the. The final remarks. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for all the organization in the articulation with Professor Proctor. What a wonderful evening we had. Thank you very much, Professor Proctor, who is already a friend of the Brazilian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. And thank you for our society, because we beat it this evening all the records in terms of engagement in number of people, number of comments, number of questions in the last months. So it was very nice to have Professor Proctor here with us. Uh, everybody, thank you very much. And we will meet again next month in, in our uh, scientific session. A wonderful night to everyone and a good rest of the week. Thank Just you. one, one cup for, thank, thank you so course. much for the, thank you so much for the invitation. If it looks like there may be some other questions, Please feel free to yes, you know, of course. To po I, post my post my email address if people want to email I, I was, me directly. Uh, I was supposed to, to say that we committed to Professor Proctor to to close the meeting a few minutes for nine o'clock because he has another meeting. But all the other questions we will address to him, and I'm sure he will be pleased to respond them all. Thank you. Yeah, happy happy to. Thank you, Doctor okay. Proctor. 
All right. Thank you Have very a great much. night, everybody.